Ludwig van Beethoven's Fifth Symphony may be one of the greatest pieces of music ever written. It's certainly one of the most famous. And those first four notes, once heard, are never forgotten. The traditional wisdom has been that in the fifth, Beethoven is railing against fate and his increasing deafness. But conductor John Elliott Gardner believes that it contains a hidden, radical message, expressing the composer's sympathy with the ideals of the French Revolution. Liberty, equality and brotherhood. It's not just a matter of his expressing his inner turmoil, it's also him nailing his colours to the political mast of the French Revolution. I believe in the rights of man, I believe in the brotherhood of all men, and I believe in political freedom. I'm going to look at the evidence for this revolutionary interpretation of the Fifth Symphony. I'll visit France, where in 1789, the world order was turned upside down. I'll be exploring Bonn, where Beethoven grew up and was exposed to radical ideas. And I'll travel to Vienna, the imperial capital that was Beethoven's home, as the revolutionary and Napoleonic wars convulsed Europe. We'll see how these extraordinary events affected Beethoven, both as a man and a musician and how his passion for the ideals of freedom and brotherhood fueled the Fifth Symphony. With my orchestre révolutionnaire et romantique, we're going to perform Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and we're going to try to incorporate the emotional turmoil and passion and the Republican political fervor which informs this great symphony. So, are you all sitting comfortably? You're not meant to be. Ludwig van Beethoven wrote his Fifth Symphony here in Vienna, the Austrian capital, where the composer lived and worked for most of his life. It's become a timeless musical monument, but it was directly shaped by the troubled times in which Beethoven lived, and this may have been underestimated in the centuries since it was written. There's no better place to start an exploration of how and why this happened than the place where the symphony was heard for the very first time in December 1808. I'm here at the Theatre an der Wien, a very important place for Beethoven and it's connected with a number of his great works. But it was in this very theatre that the Fifth Symphony had its premiere. Beethoven was 38 and at the height of his creative powers. The premiere of the fifth was scheduled towards the end of a benefit concert for himself, a packed recital of his great works. Beethoven was the first successful freelance composer, not employed by the court, so he needed the money more than most. It turned out to be a very interesting evening. How does it go, this huge event that Beethoven's program? It, it's a disaster. <laughs> it's a complete disaster, unfortunately. It's too long. Imagine, it takes four hours. So it's, it lasts until half past ten in the, in the night. Unfortunately, the musicians and Beethoven had a row. So he didn't actually talk to the orchestra himself. He only talked to the conductors. And the conductors then talked to the orchestra. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's a nightmare. What did they have a row about? Um, about uh, the rehearsal conditions and about Beethoven being very late on delivering the score. Apparently there were also uh, mistakes because they didn't have enough time to rehearse and at some point Beethoven actually stopped the concert and started again from the beginning. <laughs> Was it full? 
No. no. <laughs> Half full only, unfortunately. <laughs> now, unfortunately, at the same night, there was another concert going on um, for widows and orphans, a benefit concert, similarly as this was a benefit concert for Beethoven, yeah. personally, though. For himself. For himself, exactly. So now, unfortunately, it was only half filled. Um, tough luck. He didn't yeah. earn as much money as he would have hoped. Beethoven has become the classic example of the intense, tortured artist, but he was capable of great kindness as well as terrible tantrums, compassion as well as passion, the composer of deeply sensitive pieces as well as what became known as heaven's storming works. As we'll see, the Fifth Symphony's four movements display all these aspects of its creator. But the symphony's opening was not a soothing composition that the theatre audience could sit back, relax and enjoy. It was meant to jolt them out of their seats. The fifth, especially the first four notes, has become so well known that it's difficult to recreate the shock and disorientation that Beethoven intended. Difficult, but not impossible. Over the centuries, Beethoven's masterpiece has been performed in ways that the bad-tempered maestro might well have hated. But for over 25 years, conductor Sir John Elliot Gardner and his Orchestre Révolutionnaire et Romantique have been on a mission to play Beethoven symphonies in just the way he intended. Here at St John Smith Square in London, they've recorded a performance of the Fifth Symphony especially for us, with all the pace and the ferocity that the audience at the premiere would have experienced. Right, here we go. there's any single piece of Beethoven's that really, really sort of sets one's pulse racing, it's the Fifth Symphony. Because there's something completely implacable about it. It's so full on. And it leaves you breathless because there's this searing energy right from the, the off. Then once he's in his full stride, he just never lets up and it's inexorable. I think the thing about tempo is that it, it has to be done with total conviction. And if you feel, um, as I do, that, that the Beethoven is impatient to get his ideas over, then it's going to come over fast. John Elliott plays the Fifth Symphony at 108 beats per minute, the tempo Beethoven himself decided for it. The composer famously started losing his hearing when he was in his 20s and specified this tempo years after composing the fifth, when he'd become entirely deaf. 108 beats per minute is so fast that many conductors and performers have ignored this marking. So this metronome is set at... 108 beats per minute. Right. And this is a new invention. Beethoven was excited, and he would be bound to be, because if he had no means of conveying to performers um, because he wasn't a conductor and he was deaf and he couldn't convey his ideas. Yeah, he could tell them how fast or he slow could to tell do them. It. But sitting here and listening to that is one thing. Actually standing in front of an orchestra and playing the music is quite different. But that's why you play it so fast, isn't it? I do. I think it's a good guideline, um, and I may even go a bit quicker than that. Uh, it depends. <laughs> well, it depends on the setup. It depends on the hall and uh, in the Albert Hall. You know, you don't want to go at such a lick that uh, the music doesn't have a chance to, to register with an audience. Whereas if you're doing it in a small studio, you can get closer to Beethoven. Over the centuries, many conductors have played the fifth at much slower tempi. 
all through the early part of the 20th century, the great maestri of the day um, tended to expand it and to, to be very self-indulgent and to pull around the tempo. One recording even slowed it down to close to 74 beats per minute. OK, this is now at 74. How does that strike you? Bit of a bore, bit of a snore, actually. I mean, how, how can one... How can you galvanise an orchestra? Da, 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 dee, uh, do, da, 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 dee. I mean, they absolutely fall asleep in their chairs. <laughs> it's having that effect now. Well... <laughs> And he uses that kind of uh, uh, motto or, or icon, as it were, the, the ba 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 ba, those four notes, um, which are given in that rhythm as a as a constant, right the way through the symphony. So, what message could Beethoven be trying to convey with a furiously fast performance of his four-note motif? By the time he composed the fifth, Beethoven had accepted that his deafness was incurable. The terrible realisation came during a stroll with a friend, Ferdinand Ries. Ries says, Master, listen to that shepherd blowing on his pipe. And Beethoven realises he can see the chap playing the pipe, but he can't hear him. And that's the first time that we know of that it's not just someone talking that he can't hear, but it's music. And what else is he but a musician? This is why many have believed that the four notes are the composer railing against his deafness. But not everyone. John Eliot thinks differently. So what do you think Beethoven was saying in the Fifth Symphony? Well, I think he's really trying to convey um, his deeply held political beliefs at the time. Um, I mean, Beethoven's political beliefs went up and down, but at the particular time he was writing the symphony in the early 1800s, he was completely under the spell of the French Revolution and even contemplated moving from Bonn and Vienna to, to Paris. And it always amuses me that the thought of Beethoven prowling around in, in Paris and not speaking a word of French or very little. And, you know, how would musical history have developed if he'd had become a Frenchman? It would have been a yes. bit different. Could the revolution provide the secret to the Fifth Symphony? If so, the answer will be here in France. Fontainebleau Palace, just outside Paris, is a perfect example of the world that the revolution revolted against. Monarchies with a divine right to rule, absolute power and the privileges that came with it. Privileges like this 1500-room chateau, property of the French royalty since the Middle Ages. The French monarchy was the most entrenched in Europe and appeared to be everlasting. And this was just one of their playgrounds. As far back as the 12th century, French kings and queens and their families and their guests and their servants and their retinues had come here to escape the heat of Paris. And walking around out here, that sense of solidity, of confidence, of complacency even, is very apparent. And that's just the exteriors. I mean, compared to the interiors, this is understatement. The 18th century diplomat Talleyrand said, those who have not lived through the years around 1789 cannot know what is meant by the pleasure of life. Here in Fontainebleau, you can understand what he was getting at. The French king Louis XVI and his bride, Marie Antoinette, stayed here between October and November 1786. Among the lavish festivities laid on, the royal couple attended a specially staged ballet, here in this beautiful ballroom. They also had a chance to examine some new building work, including this room, a gift from the king to his queen. This exquisite room, with its own ensuite bathroom, was Marie Antoinette's private retreat. 
It's all set in silver, which you can see on the wall coverings there. And there's more silver in these two pieces, which are both original, they were here. This roll top desk and this hopper table. And um, it's silver and it's mother of pearl and there's brass and there's bronze and there's boxwood. I mean, they are quite beautiful. On her first visit to Paris, the 14-year-old Austrian princess was greeted like some sort of rock star or celebrity. Tens of thousands of people turned out to see her, and 30 of them were trampled to death in the crush. But by 1789, stories of this sort of luxurious excess had turned public opinion against her. The Queen's lavish lifestyle did not go down well, with a population struggling with years of bad harvests, high taxes and corruption. Resentment against the aristocracy and the clergy grew. And with it came a hunger for change, for freedom. In the long hot summer of 1789, the discontent reached breaking point and Paris was consumed by chaos, riots and looting. Then, on the 14th of July, a mob stormed the Bastille, a fortress and a prison that stood as a symbol of royal power. Paris was now in rebel hands. Fontainebleau Palace was plundered. The French Revolution had begun. This is Le Café Pocop, Paris's oldest café and supposedly the place where Voltaire drank over 40 cups of coffee a day. It's also the place where the leaders of the French Revolution met regularly. Danton, Robespierre and Marat sat here plotting the events that would etch themselves in the imagination of a generation. Across the continent, those inspired included Europe's leading thinkers and artists, Shelley, Coleridge, Goethe, Schiller, and of course, Beethoven. The English poet Wordsworth wrote, Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Beethoven was just 19. The old feudal order, the Ancien Régime, was to be abolished, and its privileges, hierarchies, laws, courts and taxes would all be swept away. On August the 26th, 1789, the National Assembly, based in this building here, issued a guiding, founding manifesto for how it would work. It was called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen. In England, in Germany and right across Europe, there were many, including Beethoven, who hoped that this might be the start of a new era. This might be year zero, where the Enlightenment ideal of a system of governance based on freedom, equality and common good would finally become a reality. It's generally accepted that Beethoven believed in the ideals of the revolution during these heady early days. But what's the evidence that those ideals later found their way into the Fifth Symphony's first four notes? I think it's a clandestine, um, subversive way of articulating immensely uh, strongly held beliefs. Mm. And the fact is that there is this French revolutionary hymn by Cherubini, the Hymn du Pantheon, which mm. has this sort of rabble-rousing little chorus. Uh, Nous jurons tous le faire en main. We all swear, sword in hand, de mourir pour la République, to die for the re Republic, et pour les droits du genre humain, and for the rights of man. In rehearsals, John Elliott and his orchestra performed this chorus for us. Nous jurons tous. Yeah, nous jurons tous, le faire en main. OK, slowly, one and two and one. John Elliott sees a similarity to Beethoven's opening notes. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's, it's not just simply against fate or death or disaster. It's exuberant 
enormous feeling of, yeah, we can do it. It's within a human capacity to do it. Where did you get the idea originally that this is what he was up to? It's not in the least bit original, I'm afraid. I, I read it um, when I was a student in Paris uh, in, the, in the late 60s, and it was um, a German musicologist, Arnold Schmitz, who had suggested there might be a rapport between, or a link between his views and the French revolutionary mm. hymns which were in circulation. And so I went off to the Bibliothèque Nationale and did a bit of sleuthing there, and sure enough, uh, the music kind of fits the themes that Beethoven introduces in the first movement, in the famous ba 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 ba, which goes nous jurons tous le faire en main, which gives you a sort of clue to the type of rhetoric mm. and the tempo, actually. <laughs> Luigi Cherubini, an Italian composer who supported the revolution and settled in France, wrote his hymn in honour of this building in the heart of Paris, the Pantheon. Its history is steeped in the ideal of fraternité, brotherhood, that John Eliot believes drives the Fifth Symphony's first movement. The Pantheon was built as a church, but in 1791 was transformed into an altar of liberty and a secular shrine for great men. In the crypt below are buried two French philosophers who inspired the revolution. Here's the man known as Voltaire, and just across the way, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. It's the perfect place to find out more about the French revolutionary music that Beethoven may have drawn on. There were many hymns uh, written for the revolution, so the, the one by Cherubini is particular in that it was, uh, it was especially grand and it called for a, for a huge orchestra, 77 players, which was very big at the time. Would Beethoven have known Cherubini's work? Beethoven certainly knew Cherubini's work because they were published and they were there for everyone to, to read and play from. Uh, he would also have known him because Beethoven was in contact with French musicians like Kreuter, who gave his name to the Kreuter Sonata. So um, I'm sure that these musicians didn't only make music together, but they, they must have talked and read music and, and discussed it. A very touching anecdote about um, French soldiers visiting Beethoven and making music with him. So if, if uh, I could back, go back in time, this is one of the things I'd like to, to witness. And what do you think the appeal to Beethoven was of this music? There is the élan, there's the, the, uh, the energy, as you say. And énergie was one of the key words of, of, um, of philosophy at the time. Mm. Uh, the, the, the revolution was a time of, of, a time of energy. Uh, after the decadence of the Ancien Régime. Music was, uh, was public by definition in these occasions. Uh, it served the function of creating a, a sense of collective uh, feeling around the revolution. So it seems likely that Beethoven did know about this new, radical form of music, a public art that could express powerful political messages. And if John Eliot's theory is correct, that was exactly the effect that Beethoven was after. Rouget de Lille, who composed the, the Marseillaise, um, he was an officer and not a professional musician. And there's a famous painting showing Rouget de Lille declaiming his Marseillaise when he first had the idea. But then it, it became um, a kind of national anthem. <laughs> But he, t he hit on, on this fantastic tune, uh, which is uh, characterized by, by its élan, its, its, uh, the way it goes for the high notes. Allons enfants de la patrie. And uh, although every, nobody can sing it properly because the note is a bit too high. <laughs> it's too high. Yeah. <laughs> Especially, and then it goes very low again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Especially yeah. on football fields, it, it's, it's rather painful. It's precisely this énergie, a kind of musical call to arms, that John Eliot tries to capture and communicate in his own performance of Beethoven's Fifth. 
Schmidt's theory, which I profoundly believe in, and and I feel it gives it a tremendous edge uh, mm. in performance, is not um, provable in absolute terms. It's 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 an it's a way in, and I think it's a good corrective, or it's a helpful corrective to the to, to the rather wishy-washy, yeah. you know, uh, fate and and all the rest of it. Beethoven himself was far from a wishy-washy character. He was a notoriously tough and turbulent personality. But if he was also a radical who supported French revolutionary ideals, where did all that come from? Perhaps the answer lies in the composer's early life in Germany. Never an easy man, Beethoven, and this is the archetypal portrayal of him. Intense, furious, brooding, heaven-storming. And this extraordinary, contrary personality was shaped here in Bonn during an unhappy childhood and a troubled youth which made its mark on him as man and as artist. Beethoven was born in 1770 and grew up here at what's now called the Beethoven House. The infant Beethoven joined a musical family in a very musical city. His beloved grandfather was Kapellmeister, resident composer at Bonn's court. But he died when the boy was only three. So how happy a home was the Beethoven house? This is it, is it? Yeah, we believe it's, uh, this is the birth room. But uh, in fact, we are sure this is the bedroom of the parents. Right. His father has been um, a very, not, not so gifted as his grandfather. This has perhaps been a problem. If right. you have a great father and a great son being in the middle of it, it's not very easy. Um, he had some problems with alcohol. You would say Beethoven had a complex relationship with his father? Yeah, this is certainly true. It's not a normal family. Beethoven's father had to train him on music, on keyboard, on violin, on thorough bass. So, and Beethoven had to learn this. Mm. And the methods of the time is punishment. Involved for, hitting him. Yeah, for all children, not only for Beethoven. Beethoven as a child, he doesn't seem to have been happy. He played with his brothers. He played with other children, but not very much. Mm. He, he had to practice very much and he was very shy because he didn't went to school very long time. So he, he was very unsure of himself. When Beethoven was 10, his father took him out of school to concentrate on music. He hired a teacher, Christian Gottlieb Niefer, who some believe influenced not only Beethoven's music, but his political ideas. This is Bonn's Palace Chapel, the rather grand venue where Niefer, who was court organist, taught the young Ludwig to play. Beethoven played the viola, the piano and the organ, all brilliantly. But he wasn't an infant prodigy as a composer. He wasn't like the young Mozart, who by the age of 10 had knocked out a series of symphonies and concertos and even an opera. No, this was a boy who needed nurturing and Niefer was the man for the job. He'd had problems with his own parents and he helped give the young boy a voice of his own, both as a player and as a composer, away from the influence of his father. And when, at the age of 12 or 13, the boy said to his teacher, look, I actually want to write some piano sonatas. Being a composer himself, he said, go for it. And Beethoven did. And we have, at the age of 13, his first three piano sonatas. Absolutely incredible. Niefer occasionally let Ludwig stand in for him as court organist, playing here for Bond's ruler, the Elector. Niefer introduced him to the works of J.S. Bach, who at the time was considered difficult or was just unknown. And it wasn't only unorthodox music that interested Niefer. 
He was a member of the Freemasons, of the Illuminati, of something called the Reading Group, which were slightly secretive groups of intelligent young men who were playing with ideas that would make the owners of these sorts of palaces distinctly uncomfortable. At the time that the boy, Ludwig, was studying music with Nefer, the Enlightenment was sweeping Europe in all branches of the art, literature, the theatre, music, philosophy. And for the first time, the theory of the divine right of the monarchy was being questioned. Hang on a minute, these people don't have a divine right to be ruling over us. And Nefer, a born revolutionary at heart, he's bound to have just chatted to Ludwig. And as a 12-year-old boy, you're going to listen impressed, aren't you? So I think Nefer was more than just a teacher for the young Ludwig. He was a kind of guru. This guru had no time for the Catholic Church, but he was religious and also had faith that mankind could create a better society. It's possible to detect the influence of these views in the second movement of his pupil's fifth symphony. It's very gentle and, and, and listen. And uh, in the other movements, there's often incredible beauty and, and a softness. The other thing that, 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 that is so new with Beethoven and so sort of enticing about the, the Fifth Symphony is the extraordinary kind of humanity of the man, the humanity of his breadth of vision. We don't know a lot about Beethoven's religious views. One senses um, that he had religious views that were optimistic. And you get a kind of um, uh, foretaste of that in this second movement of the, of the Fifth Symphony, that it feels like a prayer. In contrast to the, to the uh, struggle and the strife of the first movement, that Beethoven is suggesting that um, in humanity there is a capacity to, to perfect itself. So that it's a prayer in that sense for a better, a better soul, a better human being. In his mission to express the real meaning of the Fifth Symphony, John Elliott and his orchestra insist on using instruments from Beethoven's time. They were in transition between Baroque and modern design, and the musical experience is very different for the audience and the players. I mean, yeah. of course one can play this music on, on modern setup, but it mm -hmm. produces a different type of ethos, doesn't it? Pete, can you, can you show us? I it's mean, a different sound, yes. I mean, I've got... This is, this is a, a lovely old Italian violin with all gut strings on, including a, a, an original type of G-string. Um, and it's sort of... Uh... Yeah. There's a, a kind of definite purity about that, which I find very attractive. So when you, when everybody in the orchestra's got these strings on it, it changes the, sound, the string sound tremendously, I think. It's uh, more layered, isn't it? You get more different textures. Different feel and a different sort of sensitivity that's required. I've got here so, uh, exactly the same maker, but this one's got modern strings on. They are sort of nylon um, metal.
It's a completely different type of sound. You have to play it in a different way. It's more powerful, it's more fruity, it's, uh, it's got more uh, kind of sheer density, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. But that one, just go back to that, because that has... Uh, it's got a purer sort of... Uh... The result is that you get a, a much more multi-layered uh, strata of, of sounds, not all kind of curdling and amalgamating in the way that they do, or they tend to do, in a modern symphony orchestra. That's the good news, but playing on these instruments has its challenges too. And a thing like this, which hasn't altered much in structure or in shape or since Monteverdi's day yeah and it's only held together what just by, by a bit of block rope. of wood and some cord holding the thing together you know it's no soldered bits or anything like that not like a modern setup yeah. feels like it's going to come to pieces in your hands and the challenges are immense because these instruments of Beethoven's are hugely uh, fragile and um, compromised. If you push them too hard, they, they splinter, they crack, they squawk. With these instruments, because of their fragility and their technical fallibility, um, you have to push them to the nth degree. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who runs a Formula One team, and he was saying that his ultimate Formula One car, the moment it crosses that finish line, it would fall to pieces. <laughs> you know, it couldn't go another meter. And when we play this music on these instruments, I feel we're the same, you know? I mean, this is, this is indomitable, relentless, unreasonable music. And Beethoven seems to be he's a very unreasonable man. He makes unreasonable demands of these instruments. And we couldn't give it any more on this. This unreasonable, rebellious side developed when Beethoven enrolled at Bonn University in 1789. The French Revolution took place that very year, and the young Beethoven immersed himself in the radical ideas that swept through the university. Like students before and since, Beethoven spent time in the town's taverns, where his fellows debated philosophy and literature, and of course, tried to seduce young women. This tavern's claim to fame is that it was here that the young Beethoven danced with his first love, Barbie Koch. It's a charming image, but from what we know about Beethoven, not terribly likely, given that he was notoriously badly coordinated and socially awkward, particularly around women. Light-hearted flirtation was not really his thing, more unrequited anguish, but his personality perfectly suited the prevailing arts movement of the time. Storm und Drang. Storm and Strife. You couldn't get more Sturm und Drang than the German playwright Friedrich Schiller, and he would have a lasting influence on Beethoven and his Fifth Symphony. Beethoven went to see a production of Schiller's The Robbers here in Bonn. This was an epic melodrama which featured a hero who was a student, a revolutionary who decided to rebel against what he saw as the hypocrisy of class and religion and economic inequality in Germany. 
You can imagine Beethoven was a fan, but it was more than that. When the play premiered at Mannheim in 1782, an eyewitness wrote, the theatre was like a madhouse, with people rolling their eyes and clenching their fists and outcries from the audience. Strangers fell with sobs into each other's arms. Women became unconscious and had to leave the theatre. There was a general uproar, a chaos. That was the effect that real art could have on an audience. This is not entertainment for people. This is a form of experience of drama, of perhaps at that time almost unparalleled power and strength. I think that gives Beethoven a vision of what an artist can do with an audience. I can't prove it, but the relationship of how audiences felt about Schiller's The Robbers in about 1780 or 1790 or so, and Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is unmistakable. Beethoven remained less lucky in love than music, but he never stopped believing in the possibility of romance. Beethoven's history with women is not a hugely successful story. We know for sure that he proposed marriage three times to three different women. We know he was turned down each time. Some experts believe Beethoven may have died a reluctant virgin. And it's very possible that he channeled his unrequited passion into his music or into his politics or perhaps both. Until the revolution, Beethoven's own compositions had been rather conservative, but after it, he began to take more risks, writing more challenging works. Some of them were overtly political, and one of these feeds directly into the Fifth Symphony. In 1792, Beethoven set The Free Man, a poem by Gottlieb Konrad Pfeffel, to music. This is the first published edition of the score of some early Beethoven compositions, including Der Freie Mann, a definition of what makes a free man. And really, it's a description of Beethoven himself. The words go like this. Wer ist ein freier Mann? Who is a free man? One who, enclosed within himself, can set at naught the venal favour of great and small alike. He is a free man. It's pretty heady stuff, but this wasn't just some youthful folly on Beethoven's part. The opening bars of Der Frei Mann are identical to the opening of the fourth movement of the Fifth Symphony also set in C major. Beethoven first introduces this musical motif of freedom achieved in the second movement of his Fifth Symphony. Der Freiermann dates from many years earlier and surely prefigures the Fifth in a certain, at least embryonic, but nevertheless significant way. Already here is the rising tri triadic idea, which has some parallel already in that early song, The Free Man. Even though he's hinting at the C major of the triumph that's going to eventually come in the last movement, the sort of éclat triomphal to which we're all moving towards, um, it's a foretaste, and yet it's aborted. No sooner have they arrived at that chord than it disappears. It's sort of like a puff of smoke. It's gone into the ether.
So one could say that the goal of the symphony, freedom, has not yet been reached. In 1792, Beethoven left Bonn for good. The ambitious 22-year-old was keen to make his musical mark, so he moved to Vienna, the Austrian capital, where he would write the Fifth Symphony in 1807. By this time, the revolution that Beethoven supported was spreading across Europe, and it made his trip a troubled one. Beethoven was traveling through the middle of a war, France was trying to export the revolution, with which he sympathised, into the country where he wanted to live and work. French troops, many of them marching to the Marseillaise, were advancing into Germany and towards Austria, and defending troops were massing in the Rhineland. Beethoven records in his diary that he had to tip his driver one taler because the fellow drove us at the risk of a whipping right through the Hessian lines, which were the German troops, going like crazy. There are calmer ways to do the journey. It would be surprising if Beethoven didn't have mixed feelings as French troops threatened the city of his childhood and it was becoming harder for him to support the realities of the revolution in France. Events there were taking a much darker turn. In 1793, just four years after the fall of the Bastille, the ruling National Convention declared that counter-revolutionaries would be executed. King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette, were arrested and held captive. And they weren't the only ones. This grim-looking building is La Conciergerie, used by the National Convention as a prison. With no artificial light, this must have been an even more forbidding and gloomy place. Enemies of the revolution were imprisoned here, before being dispatched by a specially invented new machine, the guillotine. At the time, the Convention, who were ruling France in the name of the people, congratulated itself on this humane form of execution. On January the 21st, 1793, the deposed king himself, Louis XVI, was executed publicly and humanely. And this is the chapel where his queen, Marie Antoinette, prayed whilst imprisoned and awaiting her fate. This is the original floor, and this is the exact spot where she knelt. On October the 16th, 1793, Marie Antoinette was dispatched to the guillotine. And when the guillotine blade descended, the crowd shouted, Vive la nation! During the two-year reign of terror, more than 2,700 people appeared before the Revolutionary Tribunal in La Conciergerie's Grand Chamber. The condemned prisoners were held in batches in that compound behind those gates, and their relatives were allowed to come in and say a last goodbye. The revolution had begun to devour its own children and Schiller and the English poets publicly recanted, and Coleridge even called for the restoration of the Ancien Régime. Beethoven was as horrified as anyone else by the excesses thrown up by the French Revolution, but he didn't lose faith with the ideals and the principles behind it. Vienna in 1793 was an unlikely setting to write a symphony supporting the ideals of the French Revolution. It was the capital of the centuries-old European dynastic power, the Habsburg Empire, which was a major force in a military coalition battling the French armies. Viennese society was under threat yet the paranoid upper classes distracted themselves with fun and frivolity. I suspect Beethoven would have seen plenty to disapprove of here, but he also had very good reasons to keep such political views to himself.
In a letter from August 1794, Beethoven wrote, I believe that as long as an Austrian can get his brown ale and his little sausages, he's not likely to revolt. But he added ominously, People say that the gates leading to the suburbs are to be closed at 10 p.m. The soldiers have loaded their muskets with ball. You dare not raise your voice here, or the police will take you into custody. Austria seemed a bit like a police state. So why did the Austrians react so strongly to the events in France? There was this uh, family connections between the French and the Austrian monarchy, Marie Antoinette um, being an Austrian princess. Um, so it was coming straight home. And so it was really coming straight home and uh, hitting the own uh, the Habsburg family. And did they clamp down on any sort of um, uh, radical thinking? The police was um, reorganized and much more centralized. The idea was to involve as many people as possible in spying on as many people as possible. Do you think Beethoven would have been an obvious suspect? I think he would have been uh, an, an, a kind of an uh, obvious target. One can easily understand why he himself tried to keep a low profile in his um, writings. They would um, open letters, read yeah. letters. I think he was quite aware of that and um, probably kept also he um, a rather low profile as the letters have jokes in them but there's nothing dangerous there i think you know it's quite likely that they were watching him as they were watching a lot of people so we don't know but we have very good reasons to guess it turns out that the police definitely kept files about beethoven from 1815 to 1821. this makes it very likely that they would have kept an eye on him well before that so it's not surprising that Beethoven's letter of 1794 about police arrests is his last mention of politics for a long time. The glamorous city did have its dark side. Beethoven clearly felt sufficiently under surveillance to be careful with what he said and the bulk of what he really thought and felt, I think he kept for his music. And Vienna was the only place to be for an ambitious young composer like Beethoven. It was home to the two musical giants of the age, the men who Beethoven aimed to match. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who died here in 1791, and Joseph Haydn, still alive and the composer of over a hundred symphonies. Beethoven never held a paid post within the imperial court, the centre of the city's music making. Instead, he carved out a pioneering place as a freelance composer and musician. So, without having a salaried position, Beethoven needed to find an alternative source of income while he composed. Fortunately, there were plenty of opportunities for the ambitious musician to gain patronage from Vienna's aristocrats. Unfortunately, Beethoven had very mixed feelings about being dependent on the upper classes. And he had a patchy record with the Viennese rules of social etiquette. One upper class lady noted sniffily that while Haydn would arrive most carefully attired, Beethoven came negligently dressed in the freer fashion of the Upper Rhine. In other words, scruffy. Tell me where we are. This is the town palace of Prince Lobkowitz and his wife. Concerts were the main purpose of this room because they had a private concert every week. That's and him, is it? Yeah, yeah. The young and very um, ambitious um, nobility of the time, they wanted really, hmm, there was a fun factor to it. Mm. They, they invested in a guy who did good music. It was like the rock concerts of the mm. time. I mean, you had brilliant new music, very bizarre style. Mm. They were really lifted up by this kind of um, new experience. experience. About 80% of his compositions are dedicated to no noblemen. Mm. And it's um, 
because he was very into um, um, being paid. Being paid, <laughs> yeah. and he, he networked very, very well, and he was working very hard on that. Do you think he found that annoying, that he needed patrons? What I think is that it was too much for him. For example, his relationship with another patron, Prince Lichnowsky, mm -hmm. um, who wanted him to eat with him. Well, regularly at four o'clock in the afternoon, yes, we know that. <laughs> and uh, he sometimes refused that. He was older than Beethoven, about yes, 17 he looks years older. Grander. Yes, he was already a patron of Mozart. I mean, he allowed Beethoven in his house, mm. but he was with all the other servants at the beginning. He was in not very agreeable rooms, and then sort of he... He, he became his equal through his own talent. Yes. He? Then they would dine once in a while together. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then the situation changed again that Beethoven sometimes said, oh, no, please, I just um, can't deal with it anymore. So Beethoven can't do small talk, he doesn't dress properly, he doesn't turn up to dinner when you ask him. Why did everyone put up with him? Because he's a brilliant composer. They just loved his music. I'm getting a clear picture of a man whose attitude to Viennese society was complex and conflicted. On the one hand, he was genuinely fond of his patrons, but on the other, he was a meritocrat working in an aristocratic system. He famously wrote to Prince Lichnowsky, What you are, you are by accident of birth. What I am, I am by myself. There are and will be a thousand princes. There is only one. Beethoven. Is this just egotistical or is this evidence of the old firebrand radical still in there somewhere? But his patron's generosity paid for Beethoven to compose and by the early 1800s he'd written concertos, sonatas and his first two symphonies. To boost his income Beethoven taught piano to young upper-class women and there was something of a love-hate relationship here too. He hated teaching, but he needed the money. One can imagine in that confined situation, sitting next to a young, attractive woman, and that's where most often he fell in love, and of course he fell in love frequently. One failed infatuation led to Beethoven's famous piano piece, the Moonlight Sonata. Indeed, his finest work often arose from personal crisis. In 1802 came the most devastating of all. Beethoven accepted that his hearing loss was probably untreatable. He would go deaf. Many believe this is fate knocking at the door, the secret behind the four-note motif at the Fifth Symphony's heart. But not everyone agrees. He sits down at his table in this cottage, I imagine with a carafe of red wine there, knocks it back to give himself strength and writes his last will and testament. And I imagine him staring at the paper before he writes the words. He writes, Ich bin taub. I am deaf. And he stares at those words and I imagine they were sort of leaping out at him. More wine and he's admitted it to himself for the first time. And so we have the famous Heiligenstadt Testament. He's confronted his deafness by writing those three little words, and by confronting it, he's overcome it. He's beaten it, and he never looks back. If this is right, then it seems unlikely that the fifth is merely Beethoven railing against his deafness. He has already, in some way, come to terms with it. So began what's known as Beethoven's heroic period where the composer produced masterpiece after masterpiece, the Fifth Symphony among them. The outlines of many of these great works can be found in one of Beethoven's musical sketchbooks called Landsberg VI. This definitive edition has been put together by Professor Lewis Lockwood and his colleague Alan Gossman. Now what's in the sketchbook? All the sketches for all the works from very late in 1802 to the beginning of 184. Now, very late in 182 is only a couple of months after the Heiligenstadt crisis. The sketchbook reveals that Beethoven has already decided on the Cherubini-inspired motif. On the next page, and significantly marked Sinfonia, so he's writing, he writes him a note to say, this is what I'm writing, I'm writing a symphony now. 
and we find the first idea for the first movement of the Fifth Symphony in what appears to be a fairly developed form for the basic themes of the exposition. The first theme, yup up up um bum 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 bum, continuing, and then the second theme, contrasting theme, second subject, dee da dee da 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 da, etc. The rest is not clear yet, but we have the beginning, first movement of the first movement, basic ideas, and then some scattered ideas for what might come next. And Beethoven sketched a rough version of the beginning of the third movement, the scherzo. At the bottom of a page late in the sketchbook, we find some interesting new material, which turns out to be a primordial version of the scherzo of the Fifth Symphony. And that continues on the next page, where the trio of that scherzo in primitive form is present. So we have a sort of scherzo trio idea, pretty well formed. Now, the third movement in a symphony is normally something light, a dance, a minuet, something relaxed, jolly. But Beethoven had other ideas. It starts off very unconventionally as a lyrical, slightly ambling figure in the cellos and basses. And that is just a preamble to the opening rhythm, the motto that's been there right from the start of the first movement, but now given in slow whole notes by the horns. <laughs> And it's, it's such a, um, a, a, a vigorous tramp um, uh, of, of, of music, as though Beethoven is saying, this is how it's going to be. This is what I really believe in. And it really does feel as though uh, humanity is on the march again. Then he does something quite extraordinary. In the place of a trio, the trio is usually the, 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 the kind of contrast to the minuet in a Mozart or Haydn symphony, he goes completely berserk, totally berserk. He sets off the cellos and, 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 and basses and, and, and violas. <laughs> and you think, well, what on earth is going on here? It's as though this inexorable march of the, the troops going into battle has suddenly been diverted by a, a few complete hooligans who are dashing off into the undergrowth saying, no, 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 we're not going to go on this route. We're going to go somewhere completely different. It's, it's a kind of um, distraction, and then you go back to the security of the, the march tune. Here in the third movement, it's Every, everybody coming together as though asserting that there is um, an end to this long march of the symphony and um, there will be something of a conclusion. Who, who knows at that stage what it's going to be? So the scherzo seems to be revolutionary in more than just musical form. 
Maybe Carabini's motif here is a reminder that the fight for the rights of man continued, as did Beethoven's own struggles in repressive Vienna. Despite the personal risks, in the late 1790s, he attended the salons of the French ambassador, mixing with radicals and French musicians. It's most likely here that Beethoven was first introduced to the work of Carabini and other revolutionary composers. France and its republican ideals seem to have been very much on Beethoven's mind in the early 1800s too. The Landsberg VI sketchbook also contains the first outlines of his only opera, Fidelio, that was inspired by the fall of the Bastille prison in 1789. Beethoven also wrote very detailed sketches for his third symphony, the Eroica, the Heroic Symphony. It was originally named directly after this man, Napoleon Bonaparte. As a young general, Napoleon had masterminded the French Revolutionary Army's military success across Europe, sweeping away old regimes in the name of liberty, equality and brotherhood. Napoleon symbolised the triumph of the individual, the obscure Corsican who came from nowhere in an incredibly short period of time to make himself the most important man in Europe. There's obviously a degree of self-identification with Beethoven. They were both self-made men. They were the same age. They were even the same height. But the important thing for Beethoven, as with so many others at the time, was that Napoleon was the new standard bearer for the ideals of the revolution. But for many across Europe, Napoleon was becoming a parody of all he was supposed to believe in. And in England, caricaturists began developing the satirical stereotype of Bonaparte that has lasted up to this day. And the caricaturist's main line of attack is that Napoleon's very small. Yes, <laughs> that's in, fact, it. in fact, he wasn't very small. He, he was um, five foot six, which is perfectly decent height, um, and the average height for a Frenchman at the time. Um, but we, if you show him as very small, then you know we don't have to be that frightened of him. You also show him as evil, so we have to um, fight small, him. Small evil but person. Small evil person who we can overthrow. Yeah. So he became known as Little Bony. Little Bony. Yeah. And there he is. And who's this? This is Marianne, the genius of France, this horrible harridan, <laughs> blood-soaked, of course. Um, and she's dangling him as a little child on her hand. And these mm. are, again, he's very, very small, but these are reproduced on mugs. These are on mugs. But these show um, what will happen if Napoleon did arrive in London. And he's standing outside the print shop, of course, of Mr. Fors um, in Piccadilly, and he's pointing to lots of prints of, of buildings in London and pointing to the Bank of England and saying, can I have that one? <laughs> and the huge um, volunteer soldier is saying, no fear. No. <laughs> Off you go. Um, and he's at least double his size, he's so double there his is size, no threat. Of course, no threat. Beethoven developed his own doubts. As he became more powerful, Napoleon had the royal Fontainebleau Palace refurbished for his own personal use. It's what they called la vie de chateau. Quite agreeable, really. In 1799, a coup made Napoleon France's first consul. Elections were suspended and he assumed near dictatorial powers. Napoleon had this beautiful room redesigned after he'd seamlessly taken over the king's old palace and placed himself in it. Beethoven, like many others at the time, had a love-hate relationship with Napoleon, wavering between admiration and disgust. But he clung on to the hope that somehow the French leader could make the ideals of the revolution a reality. In 1803, he planned on naming his third symphony directly after Napoleon. A friend of Beethoven's wrote, at the time, Beethoven held him in the highest esteem. I saw a copy of the score lying on his table. At the head of the title page was the word Bonaparte. But the final straw for Beethoven came when Napoleon was crowned emperor in 1804. All in the cause of revolutionary ideals, obviously. Even at home at Fontainebleau, Napoleon liked to have a throne. 
In the actual ceremony, Napoleon wasn't crowned by the Pope. He took the crown from the Pope and put it on his own head. And to rub salt into the wound, as he did so, he swore an oath to liberty and equality. It's said when Beethoven heard this, he flew into an absolute rage and began a sort of foul-mouthed rant about Napoleon. Beethoven shouted, he will trample over all human rights to humour his ambition. He will place himself above all others and become a tyrant. And he also scribbled out Napoleon's name from the cover of the front page of the Third Symphony. And he scribbled so hard in his anger that he went right through the paper. Sometime later that year, Beethoven changed the name of the work to Symphonia Eroica, the Heroic Symphony. But he still dedicated it to the memory of a great man. And some believe that great man was still Napoleon. It can't have been an easy time for Beethoven, seeing his hopes for the French Revolution raised and then disappointed for a second time. So perhaps we can see this crisis of faith reflected in the Fifth Symphony's scherzo. Beethoven is in some eerie terrain here. To me, it's like looking at an image uh, in, in a cracked mirror. The stopped sounds that the horns are obliged to make produce this very pinched and uh, unearthly sound. It's it's like a, a sort of stray bird of prey, a falcon or a or a or a crow or a rook coming by and cawing. And it creates a sort of sensation of a barren landscape, a, a, a godforsaken landscape. It seems that after Napoleon's coronation, Beethoven lost faith in the disillusioning realities of revolutionary politics. So how is the Fifth Symphony, written four years later, a political symphony in a wider sense? A clue may lie in the later work of Beethoven's great intellectual idol, Friedrich Schiller. He felt that the French Revolution had failed, and he wrote dismissively, a great moment has found a little people. But he did think, alternatively, that art could be used to enlighten humanity. He called this the aesthetic education of man. And this vision of moral character being improved by art, including music, had a huge impact on Beethoven. He ascribed strongly to the Schillerian idea of the artwork, which would embody a power to inspire present and future generations, even through periods of, of repression. And so we find, actually, that in Beethoven's career, there's this Schillerian trend whereby his tragic works very rarely end in a tragic mode. Rather, they posit an alternative to the, um, to the dark forces. And there's perhaps no single work that does that quite so powerfully as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Schiller's theory had breathed new life into the ideals that Beethoven had long held dear. I think this may well be what Beethoven had in mind when he finally sat down to write the Fifth Symphony in the summer of 1807. We've talked a lot about the historical context of the Fifth Symphony, about the motivation behind writing it, about the influences on it, but here we are. This is the location where Beethoven actually sat down and wrote it. This is the somewhat unlikely crucible of that extraordinary work. 
The building is called the Pasquilati House, after Beethoven's landlord. This recreated apartment is beautifully clean now, but that wasn't the case when Beethoven was writing here. Then it was heroically messy and filthy. Beethoven was known for living in squalor. The Baron de Tremont wrote after an 1809 visit, picture to yourself the most disorderly and dirty place imaginable. An old grand piano on which dust vied for place with various pieces of manuscript and engraved music. And under the piano, I do not exaggerate, an unempty chamber pot. That's one period detail which the Pasquilati House have chosen not to recreate. Back in 1807, it wasn't just Beethoven's apartment that was in a mess. There were personal problems as well. At about the time he's writing his fifth symphony, his private life is in turmoil. Yet another failed love affair. He'd fallen in love with a young pupil of his and her sister wrote back saying no. And Beethoven's great patron in Vienna, Prince Lichnowsky, said, Ludwig, I've invited some French officers to dinner tonight. Why don't you join us? Now, Beethoven, he had seen Vienna invaded by the French. The last thing he wanted to do, this great revolutionary and freedom lover, was sit down to dinner with French officers. And the conversation went round, and one of the officers said, I hear you are a very good pianist and composer, Herr Beethoven. Will you give us a tune? Beethoven stood up and said, I do not play for people like you. Stormed out into the night and would not have anything more to do with Lichnowsky. So it's probably not too surprising that Beethoven was scrabbling for commissions in 1807. This aristocrat said, look, I say, Herr Beethoven, you wouldn't write another symphony, would you? Perhaps even dedicate it to me? I'll pay you 500 florins. Beethoven actually said, I'll do it. Is it possible that the main motivation for Beethoven writing his Fifth Symphony was simply to pay the rent? I don't think so. And not when you look at this portrait, which was painted just after he'd written the first sketches for the Fifth Symphony. And he's looking suitably romantic and radical. And this was a time in Vienna when one author wrote, simply to have sideburns meant that one was suspected of Jacobinism. And it's a pretty good pair of sideburns. And he did keep the Cherubini inspired first four notes from those first sketches. And he kept the draft of the third movement. In that sketchbook, Beethoven was vague about the form that the Fifth Symphony's finale would take. Maybe some kind of march, he scribbled. And after the scherzo's gloomy conclusion, a march it was. One based on the music of the French Revolution and containing another coded message. And there's very hushed feeling as though something ominous is about to happen. It's really, that's sort of the calm before the storm. And eventually the timpani, the, the kettle drums, uh, emerge from the gloom with a crescendo. And then the whole sky erupts with this blaze of sound and you're into the last moment. takes uh, what seems to be a, a fairly straightforward march of the French Revolution. He then, in typical Beethoven fashion, he writes variations and uh, elaborations of it. And subversively and sort of surreptitiously, he introduces a new theme, which turns out dim bom bom dim bom dum 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 and thanks to dear old Mr. Schmitz back in the 1920s, we can 
pinpoint the origins of that, and it's Mr. Rouget de Lille, um, him Dithyrambic. Uh, Rouget de Lille was the French revolutionary composer who composed the Marseillaise, and sure enough, it's Chantons la liberté, la liberté. During his rehearsals for the Fifth Symphony, John Elliott showed us what this revolutionary song sounds like. If you listen carefully in the last movement of the Fifth Symphony, this is what you hear. So there you have a completely impossible statement of, of a, a, a peon to liberty, to freedom, in repressive Vienna. That gets submerged in so many conventional performances. I think it's really crucial that the audience clocks that, that they register it. We had a political tract in the opening movement, all about the rights of man, and here we have liberty. So Beethoven is doing two of the great three motto symbols of the French Revolution. But could it just be coincidence that Beethoven uses this theme? How do we know that the musical reference to Rouget de Lille is deliberate? John Eliot believes that the proof lies in Beethoven's handwritten score for the Fifth Symphony. It's extraordinarily moving looking at this facsimile of Beethoven's score of the Fifth Symphony because on the face of it, it's anarchic. It's completely zany. It's like a sort of force at 10 gale going through a, a forest of bamboos with all these, these crossings out and, and, and things leaning forward. And we're right in the thick of the last movement. And here, for the first time, Beethoven insinuates through the textures this little quotation from Rouge de Lille's uh, hymne Dithyrambique with the critical words, freedom, la liberté. La liberté, la liberté. And it stands out very, very clearly um, in contrast to all this rather messy ornamentation and elaboration and crossings out. So it's as though they're like structural girders that, that hold the whole fabric and, and, and the edifice of the building into place. And from then onwards, it's a great sprint to the line. It's, it's a, a huge celebration of individual quest for freedom, but also the realization of a political utopia. into the values of the French Revolution at a time when those ideas were, were incendiary in, in Europe. So he comes up with this brilliant but extremely dangerous strategy of investing his abstract music with deeply subversive political content. So what was the public reaction at the premiere to this musical call to arms? Did it have the same revolutionary impact as Schiller's The Robbers, as Beethoven may have hoped? Back to Vienna's Theatre an der Wien to find out what happened on that evening in December 1808. 
What do you think the audience thought of the fifth? They didn't like it. We know that it was received well as in friendly, you know. They, they said it wasn't bad, but they were not enthusiastic about it. Right. Also, later we have accounts of Goethe, you know, the big um, uh, mm. poet, who said, you know, it's nice, but it's too much. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a house breaking down. Um, so it's too loud, it's too much, it's over the top. Um, so people were not exactly happy about what they heard. At the end of all that, how, how did Beethoven feel? Was he disappointed or cross or, well, how cross was he? Uh, well, quite cross. I don't think he was very happy at all. It was a few years before the fifth began to be appreciated in Central Europe as the perfect example of romantic individualism with the emphasis on Beethoven's personal struggle. But the response at the premiere in Paris birthplace of the ideals of the revolution was very different. The audience there recognised the musical references and embraced the symphony wholeheartedly. From then on, the fifth became a firm favourite with French audiences. I think I'm with them and with John Elliot Gardner in seeing the ideals of the French Revolution as intrinsic to the power, to the force of the fifth symphony. That was certainly the view of one listener at that first Paris performance. He was an old soldier, a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars, and he listened to the piece, and at the end of the finale, he rose to his feet and he shouted, C'est l'Empereur! Vive l'Empereur! When you're actually performing it, you're caught up in his vision, you're caught up with his a hugely daring exposition of human capacity to overcome the slings and arrows of fate. And if you give it your all, as uh, this orchestra does, and as I try to do when performing this piece, the rewards are immense. You, you, you feel total identification with the with the vision that actually is inspiring the piece as it's unfolding. He's moulding clay, musical clay, in such a way that he can only create a monument of extraordinary conviction. And that's really the, the secret, and that's the real substance of, of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony.